Welcome to this presentation about drafting a contract. We're going to think through the various issues that you ought to consider when you've given the, been given the task of drafting a contract. Um, this can arise obviously in lots of different circumstances. It can arise when a particular deal is being made or perhaps when a case is being settled. Those are two common situations, but by no means the only categories. So let's begin. Oops, went too far here. When you start a contract, it's going to be very rare that you have a blank sheet of paper and you just kind of start from scratch with no uh, models to work from. It is usual to have um, a combination of tools. You'll probably have a similar deal that has happened in your law firm that you will use as a starting point. And then you will have perhaps additional clauses, boilerplate is oftentimes what this is called, that you may take from other contracts or from a form book. And those you'll be interested in inserting. Obviously, in all cases, these items are going to have to be drafted carefully, redrafted, revised, edited to fit into the particular document that you're doing. Using forms is a tremendous time saver and it also helps you get the best product. The reality is that there's thousands of different moving pieces in the contract. And so the odds of you starting from scratch and being able to nail all of those thousand pieces is not very good. But if you're using a contract that has been uh, carefully thought through and, and is, is part of a kind of a coherent uh, piece, and then you only think about the parts you're changing, it's very likely that you'll get you'll, you'll get the benefit of all those uh, prejudgments and of course if you get to a particular clause and you're like I have no idea why this is in there I have no idea why it's phrased the way that it is it's probably a good idea to italicize that or put it in highlight and ask the attorney to evaluate is that something we need to keep or is that something needs to go away is it something we need to rewrite there can be lots of different things going on in that type of language and so since you have this it's better probably to keep the stuff you're not sure about and uh, be hesitant to throw away stuff until you are uh, confident that it's not necessary either for this deal or just generally. So, of course, when you're drafting the contract, one th or actually, let me say, so you're going to start not from a clean sheet of paper, you're going to start from probably multiple documents. And this does, number one, save a lot of time, and it also, two makes gives you a better final product. But there is a big risk with this, and I see this all the time with students who are submitting projects uh, from which they have worked from some other document. Sometimes it's a document I've provided, sometimes it's a document they found elsewhere. But what they do is they forget to carefully proofread it. And so let's say I gave them a deal involving Bob and Teresa entering a new contract. And yet the people in my story, the, 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 the assignment has to do with Larry and Gwen. Well, as I'm grading the ass assignment, oftentimes I'll see Bob and Teresa's name in it, or I'll see a she where there should be a he, or a he where there should be a see, she. It requires very careful, meticulous checking. If you aren't going to do that careful checking, then you can't use a model because you will end up with an even worse document than if you had started from scratch if you don't check to make sure your pronouns are correct, to make sure that um, you've fully changed all of the party's names. This is hugely, hugely important. Now, obviously, in a class assignment, in some sense, what does it matter? Okay, I failed that because I didn't uh, proofread it carefully. No big deal. And in some sense, there is no big deal. But in the real world, when your client is signing on the dotted line and there's real money at risk, you may have cost your client thousands of dollars, maybe even more than thousands of dollars. You may have exposed yourself to a malpractice claim or your attorney to a malpractice claim. You may be out on your ear uh, with that kind of mistake. So there are the potential for really, really big repercussions. And so that's why when you use a form, you have to think to yourself, okay, I'm using this form, so that means I'm committing to a significant amount of time of carefully reading this document, going word by word by word by word. It saves time in the long run, but it is a necessary part of that time saving is that commitment to doing the revisions. I can't emphasize that to you enough. It is absolutely crucial. Okay, but let's assume that you've signed up for that. You understand, okay, yeah, grr, grr, grr. I get it at the end. I'm going to have to spend a significant amount of time proofing. But what do I do with these models that I have? Well, there are some things to think about as you get started. One thing you'll want to think about, and this will help you decide which models to use, is the format that you want to use. 
some deals are really, really huge. I mean, it's not unusual to have a you know, 100 plus page contract. There are other deals that you can get the whole deal on a single page. Um, the format of those documents are going to vary more than just the actual number of pages. How you organize it, how many different moving pieces there are. Are you going to have an index? Are you going to have a table of contents? How are you going to arrange the stuff? Where are you going to put your, your defined terms? Are you going to put them at the beginning? Are you going to put them at the end? Are you going to intersperse them throughout the document? Those are all factors to consider. Part of the decision making process is going to be the length of the document. Part of it is going to be what the industry custom is in this particular area. Another part is going to be what the preference of your attorney is, maybe what the preference of the client is, maybe what the preference of opposing counsel is. All of those are legitimate factors in deciding how you're going to format it. It's a good idea to seriously think about those issues. In many cases, you already have some idea about the right way to go, but one thing you probably have at least one model and it probably makes sense to use that model as a starting point. But you'll definitely want to think through the format. Another issue is of course the purpose. Why are you in, why are you creating this document? Um, what is the reason for the document? What is the reason for the contract? Um, you may think, well, why do I need to know that? I just need to know what the deal is. We'll see later how that can be important in how the contract is interpreted. Um, but we'll get to that in more detail in a couple minutes. The subject. Obviously, you need to know the subject in order to uh, draft the contract. Consider the information sources that you have. In most cases, it's going to be your client. It could be the attorney. But in some cases, it's going to be the opposing counsel. Now, you use the word opposing counsel somewhat Care, somewhat carelessly, I guess you could say. We use that term when we're talking about litigation, but it doesn't really fit here because usually, unless we're settling a lawsuit, usually when you're into a contract, the parties aren't in opposition to each other. There is in some sense um, a coming together, of working together, of looking at this deal as good for both sides and that both sides can be benef benefited by the particulars of the deal. So while there is some some element of opposition, for example, if I'm selling you something in this contract, well, every dollar more I charge you is a dollar I get to keep and it's one fewer dollar you have in your pocket. So in some sense, there is a zero sum game involved. But in other senses, there may not be a zero sum game involved. For example, I might have four different cars I'm selling. They're all the same make and model. They just happen to be four different colors. Honestly, I don't care which one I sell to you, but you care. You care which color you get. And so in that situation, specifying the color in the contract, getting it right and describing the one that you want isn't a zero sum gain. You gain the color you want doesn't disadvantage me in any way. And so thinking through how those issues are going to play out and where to get the information source or whether, where is going to be the right place to get the information is an important part of that process. You know, in a perfect world, you'll be in the room when the deal is being created. And so you'll be able to take copious notes and be able to, to do the deal from that standpoint. If you're not present, then hopefully you'll be given very careful notes from the people who are present in the meeting. Uh, that's good, but it's a little less good because sometimes the, the note taker may not have known exactly uh, precisely what needed to be captured in the deal, um, but it can be a good starting point. But even with careful notes and even with um, being present, there's going to be some issues when you start drafting that you often have to realize, hey, wait a second, no one even thought about this issue. What do we want to do about this? And so then there will be the time for you to go back most likely to the attorney and say, how do you want us to do this? The attorney may say, well, let's draft it this way and see what everybody's comments are to it. Or the attorney might say, good question. Let's uh, talk to our client to see what his or her preferences are. Um, so there can be lots of different paths that we get when there are those open issues. Industry customs can also be a way to resolve outstanding issues. There may be a certain way that this industry usually resolves the question. Does that mean that we have to follow industry custom? No, but it probably means if we don't specify, then the industry custom will control. So it's important to know the industry custom even if we don't intend to follow it. The audience. Are we writing to other attorneys who will be uh, fulfilling the terms of this contract or are we, are we writing this contract so somebody with a, a, a high school diploma or perhaps even less than a high school diploma, perhaps somebody whose first language isn't English, can implement these terms. Those are two very different audiences. It's relatively easy to write a contract for the legal professional to be able to implement. 
it's pretty difficult to uh, write a contract that somebody who has limited English uh, reading skills can understand the deal and can do what needs to be done. Um, so you have to consider kind of where the audience is and, and who's going to do that. That can also impact, impact how we're going to organize the information. There may be some sections where the attorneys and paralegals are going to be involved in doing stuff. There may be other sections where someone in a warehouse is locating the items and he or she needs to have that information. It may make sense to organize the material so that that section, this, the section where the warehouse workers uh, get the data they need, have that all in one location, then have another section where other professionals are involved with. It wouldn't make sense for the warehouse worker to you know, turn to page 14, 73, and 297. That's not efficient. Better to have that all in one place, probably with some clearly uh, he clear headings to, he to point the reader to the right place. You want to make clear what limitations exist. Um, you know, are there certain deadlines that have to be followed? Are there certain uh, situations that we're going to handle in a particular way? Who needs to do what, when, where, why, and how that's going to play out? You also want to give other people the opportunity sometimes to edit and to redraft. We'll talk about how strategically that can be a really good idea. In most cases, you'll find that one side does most of the contract drafting and that the other side revises and maybe has responsibility for just a very few sections. It doesn't have to be that way, but there's some advantages to having one side draft. For one thing, uh, the, the, the side that's drafting kind of feels, well, we get to, to put our spin on this deal, on this contract. Um, that's, that's one advantage to the side who agrees to do it. Another advantage is that the document is going to hang together well if one person is drafting it. All the component pieces are going to fit together, aside from those few outliers that we have the other side uh, draft. But those we can customize and tweak to fit in with the bigger scheme of things. So um, those are two big advantages for having kind of one person draft it. But there are some disadvantages to having one person draft, and these are things that have to be thought through pretty carefully. One role of contract construction is that it is interpreted against the, not, against the drafting party. The idea is that if you had the opportunity to draft it and you draft it in an ambiguous way, then you ought to be at a disadvantage. You ought to be penalized because you could have made the language tight and you didn't. So the drafter, from a legal standpoint, is in a less advantageous position. Another whammy against the drafter is the drafter has to pay for the drafting. Contract drafting is somewhat of a lengthy process. It's not unusual for it to take, you know, many, many, many hours to do a good job with it. So if you have an attorney or a paralegal who's charging hundreds of dollars an hour and you're multiplying that by 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 hours, it can become quite expensive. And so you can see how that's a reason why you may not want to bear that cost. It varies who's going to draft the contract, but usually it's going to be the deeper pocket. Um, so um, uh, the, the issue about um, the contract being interpreted against the drafter, one way to, uh, to uh, reduce the impact of that standard is to have both sides draft at least certain portions of the contract. And also to have the party who is um, uh, not drafting most of it to make several edits of the contract, you know, insist that they make edits, um, a, few, a few changes, so that you, both parties can accurately represent that we both drafted portions and we both edited portions. And then you have a clause in the contract, ideally, that says that the contract should not be interpreted against either party because either party participated in the drafting and the revising of this particular contract. <coughs> Okay, so we're at the initial planning stage. We're going to get the facts. We're going to get a model or several, and again, it may, we may be using one big model, but have several independent clauses that we want to um, include. And then we want to, you know, to have an outline. Again, the model may well provide that. We want to get the entire deal on paper, all the nitty gritties, and we may not have it organized right away. Um, this may be a later point. So, for example, we might, you know, really focus on these two, get the deal on paper, and then try to organize it around our outline. Some people like to get the whole deal done and then, it's almost like, 
you know, they, they're, they're spilling their blood on the paper and then they'll go back and, and make everything pretty and make it work out. Other people like to write a little bit, then revise and write a little bit and revise. Uh, there's no particular equation that works for everyone. Uh, there's no particular system that's going to work for every project. And so I think the, the main thing to focus on here is uh, being flexible and following your inclinations. I will tell you though that the, the path that is, I'm going to say easier conceptually is to just get the whole draft document on the paper and then to go back and do your revisions. The reason why this method is conceptually easier is that you're only doing one thing at a time. If you're drafting while you're trying to organize, you're having two functions going on. You're trying to think of a what do I want to say and where do I want to put it. If you just say all I'm going to do is just put it on the paper, I recognize it's not at all in the right place and that's okay and then you go back and do the second stage, that um, is letting your brain focus on one thing at a time. So especially when you're starting the process of contract writing, it may be beneficial to just get the deal on paper. Just bleed all you can onto the paper and then go back and clean it up. Now once you get a little bit more proficient with this, you've had more experience, you may find that you can do the multitasking. Nothing in the world wrong with that. It may actually save your client some time. And then I say revise, 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 repeat as necessary. This is a super long process. This is gonna take longer than just putting the deal on paper. If I were to say one challenge that people who uh, uh, draft contracts from the beginning, they don't reserve enough time for the revisions because this is where the activity is. This is the art. This is where the skill shines. Uh, getting the deal on paper, getting it, I'm gonna say 80 or 90% of the way there, is not to the finish line. The, the, getting the last 10 to 20% is probably gonna take as long as getting to the first 80 or 90%. There's gonna be a lot of work. The, the initial draft, this first deal, you know, is gonna get you a malpractice claim if you think that this is done. It's all of these steps that get you to where you need to be. So I only have it written here four times, but you'll probably go through the document quite a bit more than four times. One thing I suggest when you're going through the document is to look for one, possibly two things through each pass through. Um, we'll talk about some of the things that you might wanna use for this pass throughs later on, but if you are trying to look for everything in one pass, um, you won't you won't catch it all. Let's say you decide that you're gonna look for everything. Well, you're probably gonna find a lot every time you go through it, but because you're not saying, I'm just looking for X, you're gonna miss some of X. You'll catch a lot of X, just like you'll catch a lot of other stuff. Let's say uh, your, your, your problem is singular they's. When you go through, you catch a lot, but you never have a single time that you're looking just for singular they's. And so guess what? When you're not focused on it, you're gonna miss a few, and so you will have some singular days left. You don't want that, that's sloppy. That's potentially malpractice. And so you wanna have a pass through where all you're doing is you're finding all the times the word they appears, and then you're gonna to look to see if the antecedent is singular or plural. If it's singular, you're either gonna change the they or you're gonna change the antecedent. If it's plural, you're probably okay. So those are the steps that you'll have to think through. You have to be systematic about it. You also have to know your own writing. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? You may have no trouble in the world with singular they. You may be able to, when you write, you don't write singular they, or you immediately catch it when you write it. Awesome. You are to be uh, respected and admired because I don't fit into that category. I have to check for singular they every single time. But there may be something that I don't have to check for that you have to check for. And so that's where, where that self-knowledge comes in, knowing what you are good at, knowing what you aren't good at. I'll give you an example. For me, I, I don't have an issue with apostrophes. That's a very intuitive thing for me. Other folks who may not have any problems with singular they's, maybe need some extra support and apostrophes. And so that's where you might find the distinction. So you'd be looking for one, one, uh, one round of, of edits are gonna be just on the singular they, if you're me. Maybe for you it'll be on the apostrophes and maybe it'll just be on one particular error relating to apostrophes. <coughs> Oops, here we go. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off this obnoxious um, here 
There we go. I turned it off. Clearly I did it. <laughs> Here we go. Let me just go back and Not sure if I can turn that off or not, but any of it, we'll just we'll just live with it. Okay, we talked about developing an outline, and again, these are some steps in considering the outline, knowing the purpose, having a checklist of things that the contract might or should address. You can actually find these contracts, these uh, these types of checklists in a form books. They will oftentimes say, have you discussed statute of limitations? What are you going to do about that? Have you discussed what the, the legal names of the parties are? Have you discussed quantity? Have you discussed delivery dates? All of those things. Looking at similar contracts, that can be a good source, and thinking about the ordering of the clauses. Again, looking at that form book example or that previously drafted contract can provide you with a lot of ideas about how to organize the clauses, but there may be particular issues with this deal that would require a difference to top of organization. In that first draft, your goal is just to get the ideas on paper. If, if that's, uh, uh, you can worry about the format later on. Um, I'm going to suggest here, here. Um, again, for that first draft, all you may want to do is focus on getting your words on the paper. Um, I would suggest for the first several contracts you do, that's all you think about doing your first, for, uh, first write. But as you become more comfortable and competent at that, you may want to start thinking as you're spilling ink on paper, uh, some other things, avoiding surplus words, uh, finding spots at least where you know you're going to have to define the terms. Maybe you don't stop and provide the definition, but you may, you know, put a note to yourself, add definition here. You may want to consider about are there words, phrases, sentences that you can omit because you've said it several times before. Those are some things to consider. And now, as we're considering the topic of simplifying language, here we have surplus, the idea of in, um, eliminating surplus words, which is pretty much the same thing as unnecessary words. You may want to consider simplifying. So using clear, concise terms. Think carefully because every word in a contract is given weight. There's no extra words. If you use the word the instead of the word a, the court will interpret your contract differently. If you put a comma there, the court will interpret it differently than if you didn't put a comma there. And so you have to know, well, what is the difference in meaning when a contract is here and when a contract isn't, when I say the and when I say a. All, every single word, every single decision you make, even when you decide to omit a word, has legal repercussions. So there are, there is no kind of by the seat of the pants when you're writing contracts. You have to think through clearly. Why am I using this word? Why do I use the word car versus automobile? You need to know. Well, is there a legal distinction between the two? I'll tell my head, I don't know, because I, I haven't done a contract in that area. But I would certainly want to think that through and decide, do I want to use car? Do I want to use automobile? Do I want to use motor vehicle? And whichever one of those terms I use, I'm going to be committed to that term. I'm not going to refer to the car as an automobile in one place and a motor vehicle in another place. If I decide I'm going to use the term motor vehicle, I'm going to use the term motor vehicle throughout the entire document. And I'll probably have it as a defined term. So um, it's important to make a decision, you know, pick the best word, use only that word for that idea, and most likely define that term provide a definition within your document. As I said, this fits in with this idea, we, we don't use synonyms. You know, when you're writing an English paper or a short story, you, you're going to not, you're going to want to vary the word. Let's say it's a car a story about a car trip. You're not going to say every time you refer to getting into the car, or getting out of the car, you're not going to say car. 
You're going to say automobile. Sometimes you're going to say motor vehicle. You're going to say, you know, other words for it, the Chevy or the Ford or whatever that the term might be, because it would get to sound very repetitive if you kept on saying car, 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 car. That's appropriate in a short story to vary the language. You're listening to the music of the language. You want it to kind of flow and, and have an artistic statement. To a lesser extent, but still to some extent, you're going to want that when you're writing that paper on the history of the automobile or on um, a, an English paper about that short story about the car trip. You, so in the, those circumstances, you're going to want to use synonyms. When you're writing a contract, there is no literary merit whatsoever to a contract. You don't want there to be any literary merit. If you decide that this that you're going to use the word car, you use it every single time, even if you use it 400 times in the contract. And in fact, you may not even want, you may just make the decision not to use any pronouns. So every time you refer to the car, it's the car. You don't ever call it it. That's a reasonable decision to make because it's possible that the word it could be ambiguous um, because it is a pronoun it stands in place of a noun but maybe there's a point in your a contract that it's not a hundred percent clear what the antecedent for that it is you've created some ambiguity to avoid the ambiguity just use the defined term car and once you define the term you're going to put it in capital letters Avoid legalese. Um, this is especially important if you're planning on having ordinary people interpret the contract or apply the contract or do the tasks required by the contract. But even when you're talking about legal professionals applying the contract, uh, the fact is that none of us speak Latin fluently. None of us are as comfortable with Latin phrases as we are with good old fashioned English phrases. And so even those of us who have some knowledge of Latin and some experience with legal terms in Latin have a different level of understanding. And so while I'm not going to say you never can use a Latin expression, it is certainly something that I would challenge myself over that. And not just Latin expressions, but just using even legal terminology. Um, it's better to break it down and to say in everyday English what that concept is in most cases. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. There are times, like for example, the expression specific performance. Yeah, that has a legal term. I mean, those words are everyday English words, but they have a legal term that's different than the way people ordinarily use that expression. Um, if you were to translate that into everyday English, that might actually create a point of confusion because the reader might be like, gosh, this reads like they're referring to specific performance, but they never use the expression specific performance. That's kind of weird. I mean, if they wanted to establish the remedy of specific performance, why didn't they just say specific performance? I mean, so they obviously didn't want to do that or they would have said specific performance, but what they wrote, I mean, it sounds like specific performance. I don't see what's different. You can see how now we've created ambiguity. So there are some times where we'll want to stick with the legal terms. It's kind of a judgment call, and that may be something that it's a good idea to talk to the attorney about. Should I use this specific legal term, or should I tr uh, translate this into an everyday English equivalent? Refer to parties by their names. Um, it can be a shortened version of the name, especially if it's a, a lengthy corporate name. You're going to want to think through, you know, how maybe we can shorten it, maybe with initials or something along those lines. If it's a human being, usually people are going to uh, limit it to the surname. If, you know, two brothers, though, are entering into a business contract and they both have the same surname, that's not going to work. Maybe you could go with first names. But it is a good practice to uh, refer to people by their names instead of by he or she or it. Even party of the first part and party of the second part. I mean, yes, that is a clear definition, but it's easy to forget. Now, which one's the first party? Which one's the second party? It's a little bit of an artificial distinction. Avoid ambiguous pronouns such as these and keep clauses, sentences, and paragraphs short. You will see many, many contracts who do not meet this, <laughs> these rules. I have seen uh, single sentences that are several pages long in the contract. Um, I have definitely seen contracts that have had sentences that have been 
essentially impossible to read as a one unit of meaning type type enterprise. Um, so you will see models that have very, very long passages. This is where you get into judgment, and this is where I encourage you to talk with the attorney. If the attorney, many times th these will be the most important, the action sentences in the, in the uh, document that describe what the parties are supposed to do. Many times these are settlement agreements that will explain specifically what one party is giving up. And you'll see that they use about 50 synonyms to mean that same thing. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, gosh, plain English, avoiding synonyms, maybe I ought to just eliminate 49 and just use the best synonym. Um, I can see how that a, a, sounds really smart, and I don't disagree with that, but I will tell you that most attorneys, and I would include myself in this to be honest, would say, don't do it. Let me explain to you why. For though that very specific clause, that very specific sentence, um, the idea is this works. Why mess with something that we know works? Um, as soon as you drop a synonym, maybe we've lost some subtle shade of meaning. And you might think to yourself, well, okay, so I'll research that issue. Well, okay, so you go out and you spend 40, 50 minutes researching the issue and you reach a conclusion whether it's safe to drop that word or not. Well, does the client really want to pay $100 or $200 for you to do that research so that the contract is a single word shorter and um, the contract means exactly the same either way? I think most clients would say, you know what, just keep the 50 synonyms in. I don't want to pay. I don't want to pay. 30 minutes for you to figure out if we can drop some synonyms. If it works with all the synonyms, that's what I care about. And so um, when you are working from boilerplate from a particular contract, um, especially sections like, like that that have to do with uh, key provisions about what people are giving up or agreeing to do, uh, tread, tread lightly. Talk with the attorney before you say, hey, I'm really thinking about doing significant revisions to this section. What do you think? So especially when you're, when you're drafting sections, uh, you know, with freehand, um, then certainly keep these words in, in, in mind. Let's do a flip over here. Let's consider a particular circumstance. Here we go. Pull this up just a scooch. This is an organization for a typical contract. You're typically going to name the contract. I mean, you're going to put it up here probably in font, in a uh, maybe slightly larger font. I'll make this 14 point. Uh, probably in bold. You might even get fancy and use small caps like that. Um, um, and then um, you will have a, a clause where you start the, the contract. You, you are going to typically in this first section, you're going to um, introduce the names of the parties. And you can see here, I have two parties here, ABC Corporation, Inc. And I've labeled it the corporation and I have Albert Gore and I will say Mr. Gore in here in parentheses. Um, I could simplify it and just go down to Gore, that would work. Or I could have called the corporation, I could have called it ABC. That would also work. Well, we'll, we'll switch this up and just go with these particular examples. Um, I'm actually going to get rid of the the here. Now you will see some people say, they'll say here and after, but there's no need to say that. This is one of these legalistic expressions that um, are best just left out. Putting it in parentheses and then putting in quotations is enough to communicate that this is going to replace this in the contract. So once you do this, I'm not going to use this again at, until we get to the signature block. Then I will type this out again. So this will appear possibly in the title. And then in that first paragraph in the signature section. But there on out, whenever I refer to it, I'm going to use this name. It's a best practice not to go back and forth and sometimes write out the whole name and sometimes write out the abbreviation. Just always use this. 
When I'm referring to this person, Albert Gore, I'm going to use his name. This first time may be in the title. And then from here on out, I'm going to say Gore. Let's say there's a signature block for Albert Gore at the end. I will write his name out there. But I'm never going to use Albert again in this contract um, after I have defined it as Gore. Then in this first paragraph, I might come up with a shorter name for my our document. So let's say the original name of our document was the agreement to sell. Here we go. We'll just copy here and put this title up here. Okay, the agreement to sell solar power to Gore Corporation. So now I'm going to say and Gore Corporation. So this is going to, the name for our corporation would be Gore Corp. So these are actually, Gore, Albert Gore, the human being, is different So um, this is the contract, um, ABC Corporation, let's see, so we might call this um, the let's see here, we'll say ABC Corporation is entering into a contract with Albert Gore and Gore Corporation. So this means that this is one party to the contract and this is another party to the contract. Now it might be that Gore Corporation is solely owned by Albert Gore. So he's going to be signing his own name Albert Gore under the line that provides for him to sign and then also as the CEO or sole owner of this corporation. Now since we're talking about an individual I'm going to probably say individually and when we say this um, in everyday conversation, when we use the term individually, we usually mean singularly. Um, but here we mean as an individual, as a human being. So Albert Gore may be uh, signing the contract twice, once as Albert Gore, the human being, and another as Albert Gore, the CEO of Gore Corporation. Now you can see this could potentially be confusing because we're going to sometimes use Gore and sometimes use Gore Corp. And so we have to be careful that we don't use Gore when we mean Gore Corp and we don't mean use Gore Corp when we mean Gore. One strategy would be to say Mr. Gore. It's probably a better practice to have there be some distinction because this again, just by itself, I would just might have forgotten to include the corp. But with this, we see that this includes something that's not in this version, and this includes something that's not in this version. You may want to come up with a shorthand term for the contract, so we're going to call it the solar agreement. So whenever we refer to this contract again, we're not going to, within the contract itself, we're not going to use this long name. We're just going to use solar agreement. So whenever we refer to the solar agreement, we're going to capitalize all of the first letters. So we're going to capitalize ABC, we're going to capitalize Gore Corp. Now you might think to yourself, well, we would always capitalize Gore Corp, right? I mean, this is the proper name. We'd always capitalize Mr. Gore, right? So that's, there, there's nothing unusual about that. You're right, there is anything unusual about this. We would capitalize these words in any situation, but we might want to, um, but, but in this case, we would not ordinarily capitalize the word solar or the word agreement unless it's the beginning of the sentence. So here, by, by using capital letters, we are saying this is the defined term, not just a, a casual use of these two words together. Okay, so this is again, our, our title and our first, this is typically just that first paragraph. And it will usually be just basically a sentence. I know in other courses we've probably, you've probably had at Colin that has talked about the fact that you don't write a single sentence paragraph. That rule is a really, really awesome rule to follow. I encourage you to follow it everywhere but in a contract. You, you don't have to worry about it. Again, those stylistic rules are good to follow, but not when we're talking about executable documents like contracts and wills and leases and things like that. Next, we'll probably have a section which we call recitals. By this, we don't mean we're going to start dancing <laughs> or playing a musical instrument or, where, or something along those lines. These are the parts that talk about um, the, the, 
the reasons behind the why these people are trying to get or trying to uh, set this situation up. You are reciting or repeating the reasons. Um, imagine that Al Gore in his corporation is entering into this contract with ABC Corporation uh, and, and they are going to buy solar power from ABC Corporation primarily because Gore Corporation one is very concerned about global warming. It really wants to make sure that it has as small a carbon footprint as it can have. That's the focus of this particular corporation, at least with respect to this contract. Um, so you would include that in the recital section. Now there could be lots of different reasons why corporations enter into a contract for solar power. They might do it because they think it's going to be cheaper or it's going to be more reliable energy or they think it's going to be good marketing for their customers. You know, oh, well, we want a businesses is using solar energy. Um, or it may be concerned about the environment. There can be lots of different reasons. You might say, well, who cares why Gore Corp is entering into the contract? Uh, what's important are the terms of the contract. And if, if uh, ABC Corporation violates those terms, it's going to be liable. But the reason, who cares about that? Well, you're right that the reason isn't as important as the specifics of the contract, but sometimes there can be some ambiguity in the terms of the contract. And so it could be that um, ABC Corporation provides the solar power to Gore Corp just as it's supposed to, but somehow or another it generates its solar power through, through using some uh, I'm going to use the term dirty here. I don't know if that's right or not. Some kind of dirty uh, technology that actually has a very significant carbon footprint, even though it's solar power. So in some sense, ABC has complied with the terms of the contract, has provided the power that Gore has uh, wanted, has, has agreed to purchase, and has provided it via solar power, but it's not the, the clean type of energy that Gore Corporation wants. Now, Gore can sue potentially but if it doesn't have these recitals in it, it would be difficult for Gore to show a way that ABC has breached the terms. Now, of course, the best contract for Gore to write would be one that has in the action, actual, actual words of agreement language that talks about uh, how dirty the, the solar power would be. Uh, but you can't always inter, inter, anticipate every single area of ambiguity. You, you want to address it certainly in the body of the contract, but by putting in the recitals, it's just one other um, insurance piece that you're developing for your, for your client. Um, another reason that recitals can be useful is they can help you establish damages. So let's say ABC Corp um, provides the power to Gore Corp using solar power and does it in a way that has a dirty carbon footprint. Uh, Gore, sue, Gore Corporation sues over this saying, hey, yeah, you provided the power. Yes, it was solar power technically, but it was dirty solar power. Well, ABC Corp might, might say, well, how did you lose any money off of this? What are your damages? Well, without the recitals that say that Gore is really, really concerned about global warming and carbon footprints, Gore might not be able to prove any damages or at least might not be able to prove that ABC Corporation would have known that Gore would be worried about those damages. So this can be a way to help Gore prove up its actual damages. So the recitals you know, are certainly not as important as other sec parts of the uh, contract, but for those two reasons can be fairly important. So we'll have the words of agreement. Um, an example could start like this. Wherefore the parties agree dot 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 dot. And then you'll have, and again, this this one quote unquote sentence, I'm doing air quotes now with my fingers, I know you can't see me. Um, this might go on for several pages because you know ABC Corporation might agree to do 50 different things, and Mr. Gore might agree to do 50 different things, and Gore Corporation might agree to do 50 different things. Literally, this one sentence with all these clauses might go on for pages and pages and pages. Um, nobody's gonna sit and read from the first word of the sentence to the last word of the sentence. That would be weird. Um, and certainly you can write these in a way that isn't one long sentence, but just, just be aware that that is one structure. And it's always a good idea when you're writing it to, to think to yourself, where am I putting a period? Where am I putting a comma? Where does this sentence start? Where does this sentence end? The longer the sentence that you have, the more likely you are to have comma errors, the more likely you are to have sentence fragments, 
the more likely you are to have comma splices, the more likely you are to have some kind of grammatical problem. And so, again, if you're a little bit uncertain about how to use some of those points of, of grammar, or points of punctuation, you may want to think and prefer the shorter sentences. Let's talk about definitions. Definitions are ways of thinking about a term that may be different than the common meaning that we associate with the terms. I'll throw out an example here. If I were to use the word child, I do this in class, obviously I can't do it in class here now, but if I were to throw out the word child, and this is typically what I do is I'll say, what does the word child mean? And assuming that everyone in the classroom, none of the people in the classroom have heard this before, and many of them usually have, so it's not always the best example. But I'll have people say, a kid, a uh, uh, someone under the age of 18, uh, somebody who isn't old enough to enter into a contract. There'll be lots of different terms, but they almost always are focused on somebody who is under the age of 18. Okay, so that's one meaning for the word child, but there's a second meaning of the word child, and we all know this meaning, but it's not in the forefront of our minds, and I'll give you an example. Um, I am older than 18 years old, even older than 21, and yet I am still the child of my parents. I will always be their child, even when I'm 90 years old, and even when they have passed away. Uh, I guess even after I've passed away, I will still be their child. Um, so that has to do with a biological relationship. And that is not restricted to people who are simply under the age of 18. So for example, I happen to have children. They are teenagers now. Neither one has had their 18th birthday. I call them children, and they are children. Once they hit, they're two years apart. So what, what, on the day that the youngest one is 18, the other one will be 19. On that date, they will still be my children, but they will no longer be legal children. Um, so that's an example of a term, a very common everyday word that we all know that has two meanings. And so let's imagine that we had some contract language, something like this. Carl, the child of Bob will be entitled to monthly payments of $400. Okay, let's assume that when we entered into this contract, earlier in a separate section we had defined Carl. Um, Carl Smith is the biological child of Bob and Mary Smith. Carl Smith was born on, we'll say, June 3rd, um, say 2010. Okay. So at the time that we're entering this contract, Carl is definitely still a child. So do we mean, let's, let's just this, we'll say Carl, the child, actually let's say, just change it up a little bit. Carl Smith is the biological child of Carl and Mary Smith. Carl Smith was born on June 3rd, 20, um, 2010. Carl, the child, will be entitled to monthly payments of $400. So do we say the child here to distinguish this Carl Smith from this Carl Smith? So it's the kid here, he's going to get payments of $400 a month. That's, that's one interpretation of it, that we were using the child to distinguish this Carl from this Carl, because this Carl is a child, this Carl is an adult. Or we could have included this phrase to mean, as long as Carl is a child, he's entitled to these payments. But the, the, the month after he turns 18, these payments end. So are we focusing on using this phrase to identify which Carl? Or are we focusing this phrase to mean 
uh, as long as this fact is true, he's entitled to these payments. So that would be an example where you'd want to define the term child. This is obviously a sloppily written a phrase, a contract phrase, but this is the type of issue that becomes important to define the term. So you'd want to say, you know, so if you, you might have a definition here, um, you know, let me just say here, we would have a separate clause, copy, maybe have a definitional section. And you probably rewrite it as long as he is a child. And so now the payments are going to end as soon as he has his 40th birth, as soon as he's had his 18th birthday. So this is a way of clarifying this terminology. So don't think that definitions are restricted to situations in which you're using technical words or unusual words or industry specific words. Sometimes the most important terms to define are the everyday words. In your contract, you can define terms more narrowly than the average meaning associated with it or more broadly. For example, let's say you wanted to talk about uh, beer. There is probably a statutory definition in Texas as to what qualifies as beer. It's going to have a certain range of alcoholic content and it's going to be made with certain products. So for example, um, a, uh, a whiskey isn't going to meet the definition of beer because of, of how it's, its alcohol level and the ingredients that go into it. Um, then there may be some types of beer that are, for example, non-alcoholic or have a very small amount of alcohol that don't meet the statutory definition of beer, or perhaps they're extra fortified and they exceed the statutory definition of beer, even though they are made with the same ingredients we usually associate with beer. But according to the Texas statute, they might be technically defined as a liquor. And so you can see how, um, you want to, do, but but let's say you're entering into a contract with a with a beer and wine distributor, and your business sells beer and wine, and you want you think it's going to be more useful for your business to have a definition for beer that is not based upon the alcoholic content, but based upon um, the uh, the contents, the uh, ingredients that go into the beer. So even non-alcoholic or or very slightly alcoholic. A beer will satisfy the definition as well as extra strong, extra alcoholic beer might satisfy the definition. And so you'd want to make sure that you are working with terms that define that more clearly. The term beer would definitely be one you'd want to define for the purposes of that contract. And as I say, most of the time when you're dealing with definitions in a contract, you're not going to write your own. You're going because that's a term that's probably been defined in thousands of contracts. So you're going to want to focus on a definition. If you happen to be a beer and wine distributor, you're going to have a definition of beer that you like that you probably use in most of your contracts. Or you may have a few definitions that you use depending upon the preferences of your customers. You'll pull those out. If you can't find one, though, you might want to look at the statute in the state. It may make sense to, to mirror that statute because there probably will be some differences as to how you can handle and treat the, uh, the beer depending upon whether it meets the legal definition of beer in the Texas statute versus it, it's meeting a definition for another product. And so there could be reasons why you'd want to match the definition in the particular state in which you're, you're functioning in. So you'll want to take Take those definitions uh, from whatever source document you have, probably tweak them a bit, and then keep those in mind going forward, and that the ordinary meaning is no longer going to be in effect. Once you define a term, it's going to mean that every single place. So if let's say I decide to define a child in this way, I can't ever use the word child to refer to Carl and Mary's 19-year-old daughter, Samantha. I can't call her a child because I've already said what child means. I could use the word offspring, or I could use the word heir, or I could use the word daughter. Um, there are terms I can use that might sound the same, but I cannot use the word child to refer to somebody who violates this, this uh, definition that I've already established.
Okay, so now we're getting into the substantive part of the um, contract. This is what the details of what people are agreeing to. Um, again, this can also be, uh, you know, the words of agreement many times. Um, I guess up here we're saying the words of agreement are just this simple phrase and then below this we're going to go into more granularity. Let's pause here though and talk about the definitions. It's kind of a weird place to put the definitions. I would say most of the time people put the definition section between the recitals and the words of agreement or at the end of the contract. So let me just move this here just for the sake of us. Here we go. So how do we decide where to put the definition section? I will tell you historically that it would usually go after the recitals before you get to the, the nitty gritty of it. And there's a logic behind that that's not bad. I mean, there, there is some, some thought that goes into that logic. Because when you get to the actual agreement section, you're going to be using the words that, that you are going to have your definition for. And so it doesn't really make sense to use the word child when you've never told the reader what child means. And so the reader is going to be sitting back there thinking, well, I guess I can just apply my ordinary meaning in my head for the term child. And um, in that case, his ordinary meaning may be different. So if you provide the definition up front, he can't... Um, I'm sorry about this. He can't, uh, you know, honestly say that that he was deceived because the meaning was was there. Um, so that's one way of approaching this. I would say that's not the best way in in some cases. Uh, sometimes the better approach is to uh, is to think well, like a textbook. How many of your textbooks list the glossary at the beginning of the book? Almost none. It's typically going to be in the back with the index. Um, most textbooks are going to have an index, especially if there's any kind of specialized vocabulary in that particular textbook. For example, let's say you're taking um, algebra. There's going to be um, a definition for linear expression. There's going to be a definition for x-axis. There's going to be a definition for y-axis. There's going to be a definition for standard form of a line or linear equation. Uh, you know, there's going to be a definition for function. Uh, all of those terms will be defined. They'll probably be defined within the text, um, in the chapter, maybe even in the margins. But there also is going to be this one-stop shopping place where you can get typically that same definition um, at the end of the book. Everybody knows there's going to be an index. And so if you're, you're reading your math book and you've, oh, gosh, what is a function again? I can't remember. I don't see it on the page. You're probably going to flip to the back and look it up in the glossary. You might flip to the index and then that will direct you to maybe the section of the book that, you know, gives lots of examples and a more a complete definition of, full, of a function. Uh, so it might depend upon how lost you are, but the glossary is a pretty sensible place to go for that. Well, um, a contract can also have a glossary and it can also be at the end. Um, if you have a long contract, I think many people would expect there to be a glossary at the end. So there would be that the same kind of level of expectation that you might have with a uh, textbook. That's especially true, number one, if it's a long contract, and number two, there isn't a definition section in the front. You can have it in the front, though. There's nothing wrong with having it in the front, and I would defer to the attorney with whom you're working to see what the preference is. Uh, the advantages of having it in the front are, number one, uh, lots of people kind of still expect it to be in the front. And number two, um, if you are looking at the contract from the very beginning to the very end, you're definitely going to see that before you actually see words that are using that definition. Disadvantages are that um, it's not a very interesting section. And it's really a section that you aren't, you know, no one sits down and reads, you know, 50 definitions before they get into the substance of the chapter. Nobody can retain that level of specificity. Honestly, as I'm reading this section in the contract, so let's say we had, we had our definition of child someplace separate. 
maybe in the front, maybe in the back. Well, when I get to the section where I see the word child capitalized, I'm going to say, oh, wait a second, this word child is capitalized. It's not the beginning of the sentence. Well, now I need to go find our glossary and see what this term actually means in this context. And so um, I'm not going to commit to memory five different definitions. So the definition section is going to intrinsically be like that glossary. You're going to dabble in it. You're going to pop, bop into the glossary, look down, find the word you're looking for, then bop back to your substance. And so um, it, it kind of makes sense for it to be at that end section. One thing that doesn't happen with contracts, unless it's a very short contract, is people don't sit down to read cover to cover. Um, the people writing it, of course, do, but the people reading it rarely do that. And so in some sense, where you put it isn't so very important uh, because you know, the ordering of the pages aren't really how people approach the document. If you have a very long contract, you're likely to have some kind of table of contents, which will tell the reader where to find the definition section. Now, one thing I would discourage you from doing is having the definitions interspersed throughout the contract. Now, one, one place that you probably will still see it is going to be in that first paragraph where you name the parties, you come up with a little nickname for them, and you come up with the name of the agreement. But after that section, you're probably going to be using um, definitions in one central location. You're not going to intersperse them throughout the particular chapter. Or a particular section because then it becomes really hard to find the definitions. Let's say we define the term child on page seven of the contract. Then we use it again on page 94. Well, I mean, how are you going to find the definition for child? Um, I suppose you could do a word search of it, but let's say you happen to have a paper version in front of you. That's a lot of work to find where you've defined that term child. A glossary makes it a lot easier to find that particular term. So most likely you will have that centralized shopping place either in the front or the back. These terms you'd probably also, even though you're providing a definition at the very beginning, you may well also provide a definition for these terms again in your table of contents. Okay, so here we're talking about the substance. Again, this is what the parties are agreeing to. This is the meat of the contract. Obviously, this is the most important section. The draft should give a logical and short name for each part of this contract. So each paragraph, you're going to talk about one task that one party needs to do. And then the next paragraph, we'll talk about another task. And you're going to name that particular section of that. Uh, so each chapter will have a number or letter or name. Um, you could have lots of different paragraphs in this section. Um, it's a good idea to put the paragraph names in bold, a lot of times with a period. So you might have, let me just come up with an example. Uh, Gore Corp agrees to pay purchase price. And then all the particulars of what that means here. And I'm going to put this in bold. You can see here, I might actually not capitalize these terms. If you capitalize them, it's acting like they're defined. So we've already, we know this is a defined term. And so we, we can look at this and go purchase price. That looks like it's a defined term as well. So I will go to the end of the contract to see what, how that particular term is defined. So we'd have more contact. Then we might have another paragraph, ABC agrees to provide solar energy. And we can see again, we have ABC is capitalized, solar energy is capitalized. We might decide that provide should be capitalized. I, I think probably that would be a defined term. What does it mean to provide something? we have all the content going from there. It's a good idea to organize this. Um, there's kind of two ways you'll see people do it. One is that you might have all of Gore's ta Gore Corp's tasks together, then of all of ABC's tasks together. 
Another way would be to have them arranged chronologically. ABC does this, and then Gore does this, then ABC does this, and now it's Gore's time to do this. Either organization can make sense. Um, that's kind of a client preference, and um, so it makes sense to think about it, especially if you have the entities doing some things at the same time, or maybe doing things that don't really have to do with a yin and yang back and forth type thing, it may make sense to group all of the tasks together. You want to have some section that talks about how this contract is going to end, who can end it, when can they end it, how do they end it, and why, under what circumstances would it end. Um, This is usually towards the end of the contract, kind of after you've done through the substantive content. There will be boilerplate. Some common areas of boilerplate um, are things like um, choice of law, choice of forum, um, uh, a contract will not be interpreted against the drafter, that chap, that. Um, another one could be uh, statutory period, liquidated damages, severability, clause, exculpatory damage clause, which is oftentimes going to be associated with liquidated damage clause. I mean, there are, I'm not exaggerating when I say hundreds of these types of clauses. And you're very unlikely to be drafting any of these clauses kind of freehand. But, you know, let's say you have a choice of law clause and the choice of law is Missouri. Well, guess what? You now want to make the choice of law Texas. You can probably use that same choice of law clause and just substitute Missouri for Texas. Uh, there may be some particular issues uh, to think about beyond that, but at least that gives you a starting point. Then you want to have a section for the signatures. And in this case, we need three signatures. Again, we need uh, a signature for somebody from ABC Corp. Now, obviously, a corporation can't sign anything, um, but you would want to have the CEO, the CFO, somebody who is an agent of the company, ideally an officer, who would sign it, and you'd write something along these lines. So we have a signature line. I see. Robert Green, Chief Executive Officer, ABC Corporation, in his capacity as Chief Executive Officer. Of. So he is not going to be personally liable under these situations. So let's say that uh, in his capacity as chief executive officer of ABC Corporation. So let's say ABC Corporation, Robert Green signs this, Robert Green, and ABC Corporation breaches. Well, ABC, Robert Green himself is not liable because he did not sign this individually. Now we could change it. We could say individually and in his capacity. And now he's a re responsible, he can be individually sued when ABC Corporation uh, if it uh, breaches. And also ABC Corporation itself can be sued because Robert Green was essentially signing as if he were ABC Corporation for that purpose. So it's important that you have the name of the person signing, but it's even more important that you have the capacity in which they're signing. And we'll also want to have a date that the contract is signed. Do you need to have them notarized? Usually not. Um, 
there could be times where it would make sense for it to be notarized. So I'm not saying that that's never uh, appropriate, but it's not something that is routinely done. Uh, if you were to have it notarized, it's probably a good idea to have everyone's signature notarized. And you're probably going to want to have a notary for each one of the signatures. I suppose you could have them all three sign at once, you know, and then have all three signatures notarized uh, together. Um, I would defer to the notary as to how that ought to be um, implemented in terms of, of uh, complying with the rules of uh, notarizing documents. By the way, many times you will be the notary who's being asked to authenticate documents along those lines. So let's go back to our, um, let's go back to our other document here. Here are some things to keep in mind as you're thinking about your documents. One analogy I like to draw between drafting a contract is it's like drafting computer code. If you've never taken a course that you've been asked to draft computer code, I encourage you to do so, especially if you find the idea of legal writing as something that interests you and something that you want to be a significant part of your career, because there's lots of comparisons. One of the things you do with code is, is the computer, in some senses, really fast, but really stupid. It can't pick up on nuances and things like that. It will do exactly what you tell it to do. And if you write something that has more than one meaning, it's going to pick one of those meanings, and it may not be the meaning that you want it to pick. And so you're, one of your jobs when you're coding is to squeeze out any ambiguity, find it, and and address it and that's one of the reasons why you test code repeatedly well what happens you think you know what the result will be you know, let's say you computer you calculate uh, you you draft some code uh, that will function as a computer and then you type in you know two plus four and you you hit the equal sign thinking you'll get a six well you get a five something's gone wrong with your with your code um, and so you'll have to go back and, and, and look through your code and see, well, why did it give me a, a five when it should have given me, when I say two plus four, it should have given me a six. And so uh, that's the, one of the ways you, you figure out where that logic problem is. Then another thing that you're going to do is you're going to want to anticipate all the various scenarios. This is probably, and it's kind of related to the ambiguity aspect, but somewhat different as well. The reality is that when you're entering into a contract, typically, especially if it's not a settlement agreement, typically both parties are excited. They want to get involved in it. They don't want to think about the things that can go wrong. Uh, and there's a logic to that too. Um, number one, talking about how one side might betray the other or trick the other is hardly the best way to start a deal. Uh, that's fairly demoralizing and can create some hard feelings. So you can understand them not wanting to dwell upon that a possibility. Another reason people don't dwell upon what can go wrong is that probably nothing will go wrong. I mean, most of the time people do what they say they're going to do in a contract and everything works out just fine. And so spending a tremendous amount of time considering that very unusual scenario where something goes wrong, you can think to yourself, especially if you're a business person, that's not a good investment of my time to worry about that. But the attorney and the, the paralegal are obsessed with what can go wrong. That's why they're hired. When everything goes great, you don't need an attorney. You don't want an attorney. But you are getting the attorney to protect yourself against the, the thing that goes bump in the night type scenario. And so you're thinking through all of the different scenarios. I mean, some of them are pretty obvious. Well, what if uh, Gore Corporation doesn't pay? When, after it gets its power? Or what if ABC Corporation isn't able to provide power? Or what if they aren't able to provide uh, solar power? What's going to happen then? But there can be a million and different uh, additional issues. For example, what if there's a hurricane that blows through or a tornado that blows through and hits ABC's facility or maybe hits Gore Corporation's facility? Maybe there's... Um, uh, Gore Corporation files for bankruptcy. Maybe ABC Corporation files for bankruptcy. Lots of different things that you want to consider. How, are we, how do we want to handle that? Uh, sometimes the corporation might say, or the company might say, we think that is so unlikely we don't even want to handle it. I mean, imagine that you were to suggest, well, what's going to happen? I don't know. What if there's a zombie apocalypse? 
and probably your client that time is going to roll his eyes and say, look, if there's a zombie apocalypse, it doesn't matter what we have in our contract. And he's right under those circumstances. I got to give him that one. So yeah, I mean, certainly you can go too far down this, uh, this path of, of, of anticipating too many things, but it's, but most clients are not doing as much as they should. And in part because they are counting upon the attorney and paralegal to do that work. So keep this kind of marching order, this paradigm in your head as you are thinking through the contract. Okay, so let's go through some of these. And many of these we've already talked about, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Use sh simple short sentences. Again, ones that we want the everyday person to be able to understand. Uh, think about the weak reader, the person who um, maybe didn't enjoy books when he or she was a kid. Maybe English isn't his or her first language. Maybe he or she doesn't read for fun. Um, you want it written for that person if that person might be the person who is responsible for implementing it. Another good idea is, of course, if your sentences are short, you don't have to worry so much about this, but keep the subject and the verb close together. If this is something you aren't too comfortable with, um, you may want to go back through your sentences and subject these. Here, or circle the subject and the verb. Here's an example of a simple sentence. Bob mailed the letter to um, Aaron. So our subject is Bob. He's the person who's doing the verb. So I'm going to put our subject in yellow. And our verb is mailed. I'll put that in green. So these two are next door to each other. You can't get any closer than that. Let's write, let's see this sentence. Bob worried that Aaron was not checking his email, mailed the letter to Aaron. We have are the same words, except now we have a clause in between. Now this sentence, it has an ambiguity in it. It's not clear who the antecedent of his is. But it's not, but th th this is, th this part is still clear. Bob is the one mailing the letter. Um, the his is created because we don't know whether Aaron's supposed to be checking Aaron's email or whether Aaron is supposed to be checking Bob's email. But um, this is not a good structure in that we don't want to have all of this uh, distance between our subject and our verb. So it'd be better to write it like this. Worry that Aaron was not checking his email, Bob mailed the letter to Aaron. And at this point, we could even just replace Aaron with him. But now the his, assuming that we haven't, uh, in this context, it seems pretty clear that the his is referring just to Aaron, because of course the Bob hasn't appeared in this sentence yet, that now we've removed this ambiguity and we've gotten back to having Bob and the subject next door to each other. You don't have to have them this close, but this is the best practice. You, you ideally want to have them pretty close. So that's an example of something to keep in mind. And the way you approach this is just finding your simple subject and finding your verb. Use plain English and avoid legal terms unless the terms are, are terms of art. Avoid nominalizations. A nominalization is a long noun that has a suffix before a root word that is ordinarily a verb. Okay, many of these suffixes are dash e n c e i l n yeah, M-E-N-T, these are just a sample, there's a lot more. So, acceptance, you can see here we have the word, the verb, accept, I'll put this in gray, and then we have our suffix, which I'm going to put in that color. We could do, um,
uh, let's see, shipment, oops, need to do that. Well, so much for that. <laughs> okay, here we go. So shipment, now we're gonna have the, the word ship, which can be a verb or a noun in English. So ship. is our verb and then when meant makes it a noun. Um, association so associate is our verb and then our suffix shit. You can see with some of these that when you turn it into a noun, sometimes you will lop off or add a letter. In this case, we lopped off our final E for associate. These words are perfectly good English words. They're grammatically fine to use, and all of these words are useful words in English. So I'm not here to say, oh my gosh, never use these words. Of course not. But use these words judiciously. It is usually a best practice to, instead of saying acceptance, to say, I accept. So saying shipping, say it will ship or he must ship, blah, blah, blah. And sort of saying association, saying he ought to associate with or whatever the particular phrase is. So it's better to use the verb. Doesn't mean you can't use these words, but again, a good, good rule of thumb is when you see a long word, look for your verb, which is usually in the front. There could be a prefix before it, but usually near the front. That tells you I ought to think about um, turning it into a verb. Better just stylistically to use it as a verb. Avoid double negatives. This one is something that is, um, we're not talking about a grammar rule here. Many times double negatives are perfectly grammatically okay. Let's look at this sentence. Neither party may assign any right without prior, oh sorry, that is not grammatically correct here, without the prior consent of the other party. It is difficult to understand. Neither party may assign any right without the prior consent of the other party. Let's rewrite this. Both parties must attain, must attain, obtain, I'm sorry, obtain the prior consent of the other party. Let's see. Let's say a party. A party must obtain the prior consent of the other party before the party may assign any right. Um, I'm still not sure that's the C. A party must obtain consent of the other party before the um, before the party requesting the prior consent may assign any right. A little bit easier to understand. What, what my concern about this was that I didn't want it to seem like this party um, was the one who would control. So th the first party must obtain, actually, actually a better way of doing this would be to say this. I'm gonna improve upon this. So ABC must obtain prior consent of Gore and Gore Corporation before it may assign any right. And then we could flip it, copy. Gore Corporation must obtain the prior consent of ABC before it may assign any right. 
and then you could obviously do this with with gore too but you you see the concept it becomes easier to write when you don't have more than one negative and this one we have two negatives we have the without and the neither it's grammatically correct in the first format but it's difficult to follow state the same thing the same way throughout the document again if you're referring to a car always call it the car never the automobile or the motor vehicle here we have parallel structure he will provide and then we have a list of nouns. Our first noun is widgets. Then we have nails, another noun. We're doing great. But help can be a noun, but the way I'm using here, it's not a noun, we're using it as a verb. He will provide widgets, he will provide nails, and he will provide help complete the project. But we don't, but that doesn't make sense. So what we're really saying is he will provide widgets, he will provide nails, and he will help complete the project. So that's not uh, a parallel. So this one is the odd man out, so to speak. We want them all to have the same structure. So he will provide widgets, that's a noun. He will provide nails, that's also a noun. And he will provide expertise, that's also a noun. We could rewrite this sentence above so that we're not focusing on, let me just rewrite it. So now this time we're gonna have a verb followed by a noun. He will provide widgets, provide nails, and he will provide widgets, provide nails, and help, and will help complete the project. That's parallel now, because now we have help complete. Still not the best, but it's better at least. So you can uh, extend it. You can either, when you, when you have uh, the three don't match, you can either change the one that doesn't match, or you can change all the others to match the original format. Use lists and tables and bullets when appropriate. That can be a very helpful way to um, uh, make sure that these contract is complied with. If there's, if um, a Gore Corporation is buying 497 items, it wouldn't make sense to just list the items in a kind of a lengthy, you know, list here, this model number, follow this by number, follow this number, by, not item number. Better to put it in the table, maybe with a description, maybe the SKU number, maybe the price, maybe the quantity. And so the person who's going into the warehouse and locating these items can tick it off as he gets through each one of those items. Oh, I found this, I found this. Oh, I wasn't able to find this. So he puts a little asterisk by it, then he goes to the next item. The chronological can be a good idea, certainly. Use headings and titles. I don't know why I say paralegals there. <laughs> to aid the reader in finding the relevant portion of the contract. So group the stuff so that what a particular contract reader, all the things he or she is looking for are likely to be in the same place. Avoid using a modifier of items in a series. Let's look at this one. The building has central heating and air conditioning, which the builder installed in 2012. So did he install just the air conditioning in 2012, or did he install both central heating and air conditioning in 2012? It's not clear. So let's assume that he installed both. The building has central heating and air conditioning. The builder installed both central heating and air conditioning in 2012. Or you could say if he just installed air conditioning in 2012, the builder installed air conditioning in 2012. The words and and or are the bane of contract writers' existence. There's almost no more dangerous words in the English language than and or or. 
Um, you have to be so careful with these um, because they invariably create I'll say invariably, they so often create ambiguity. And one of the challenges with it is that you're not going to see the ambiguity because you wrote the contract, but it can really come back and bite you. Let's look at an example. In the event of a breach, Brown may pursue remedies against ABC Company or Smith. Does this mean that Brown can sue ABC or Brown can sue Smith, but Brown can't sue both of them? Both can't sue both ABC or Smith. That's ambiguous. If you mean he has to pick one or the other, then you should have another sentence that says Brown, see, under no, sorry, my fingers are on the wrong keys, under no circumstances may Brown pursue remedies against both ABC Corporation and Smith. Or if that's not the intent and you want to allow Brown to be able to sue both, we could say in the event of a breach, Brown may pursue rumors against ABC Company or Smith, or Brown may pursue remedies against both ABC Company and Smith. Let's look at this one. Brown and Green may pursue remedies against ABC Company. Does this mean that Brown and Smith, ha Brown and Green have to agree? So if Brown wants to sue ABC but Green doesn't, Brown's out of luck? Or maybe Green wants to sue ABC, but Brown doesn't. Is Green out of luck? Do they both have to agree together? Or do what we mean is Brown can sue ABC or all by himself, or Green can sue ABC all by himself, or Brown and Green can get together and sue ABC together. So you'd, you'd want to tighten that language up. Multiple adjectives can also um, uh, create problems. And this is really just an example of the and situation. Look at this one. ABC search company will locate qualified accounting and legal professionals. Is ABC supposed to look for a group of people who are accounting professionals? We'll say 10 people who are CPAs and find 10 legal professionals, we'll say 10 paralegals. And so he's found, or this, this agency has found 20 people that have satisfied the terms of the contract. Or is ABC supposed to find uh, people who are both accounting and legal professionals at the same time? So a CPA who also has worked as a paralegal, that would be somebody, that, the type of category they're looking for. So if you, if you really want though, if, if you're saying, no, we just want some CPAs and some paralegals, we don't want people that have both skills necessarily. Well, then you would repeat your so ABC search firm will locate qualified accounting professionals and, you need to repeat qualified here, of course, qualified legal professionals. So uh, repeating the, the noun, you might say, well, that doesn't sound very good. You're right, it doesn't. It doesn't sound as elegant. We don't care. We want something that is tight. We want something that isn't open to more than one interpretation. We don't use and or or at all, of course, in legal writing. Um, if we mean and, we write and. If we mean or, we write or. If we want both meanings, we're going to have to write both out. So let's look at this. ABC agrees to purchase a 500-pound widget or a 300-pound gadget and a forklift. So does this mean that ABC definitely agrees to buy this or the, these two together? Or does it mean that he agrees to buy either this one or this one, but he's definitely buying this? It could mean either thing. So you have to make that clear. Let's look at this one. ABC company may not rescind the contract because of hardship. Does this mean that ABC does not have the right to rescind the contract when it is experiencing hardship? 
or does it mean that ABC does not have the right to rescind the contract because to do so would create a hardship, perhaps for the other party? Whose hardship are we talking about? Avoid lots of prepositional phrases. Let's look at this one. Every owner of a paper mill in Houston will receive a rebate. Okay, so does the paper mill have to be in Houston or does the, can the owner be in Houston but the paper mill is in Dallas? So let's say that the owner is located in Houston but he happens to operate a paper mill in Dallas. Can he receive a rebate? Or how about the um, owner of the, the uh, so in that example, see the owner was in Houston, the paper mill was in Dallas. Does he get a rebate? Now the owner is in Dallas, but the paper mill is in Houston. Does he get a rebate? It's ambiguous. Use care when drafting uh, dates and listing ages. So for example, Timothy Green, age 29, is entitled to $10,000 per annum. Are we using this to identify which Timothy Green we mean? Maybe Timothy Green's dad, who's um, uh, 57, is uh, alive, and so we want to make clear which Timothy Green is supposed to get this. Or do we mean it's necessary that Timothy B Green be 29 when he's eligible to get this $10,000? I mean, if so, he's just going to be able to get one payment of $10,000 because he's just going to be 29 for one year. <coughs> Um, Green agrees to submit this order by June 29th. Does this mean he has until 11.59 p.m. on June 29th to, uh, to uh, submit his order? Or does that mean that as soon as the clock strikes June 29th, it's too late? So that's uh, the word by in English is ambiguous with respect to that. Between has that same issue too. Do you include, if you say but if the number is between, 20 and 30, do you include 20, do you include 30, or do you exclude them both? So be sure. Uh, one way to do that is on or by. If you're giving an incomplete list, make it clear. Including but not limited to. This is very common language. If you're talking about days or months, you want to think about how you're going to define them. Um, some day, months only have 28 days, um, some have 31 days. Uh, should you assume every month is a 30-day period? What are you going to do about leap days? What do you do about holiday days like, you know, Thanksgiving or New Year's or MLK Day? What are you going to do about weekends? Are there different rules about that? So be sure. Um, try to avoid using um, AM, PM for midnight and, and noon. Actually, those don't have AMs and PMs associated with them, um, uh, technically, uh, but better to write out noon. And if you're saying, well, noon isn't as bad as midnight, well, is midnight associated with uh, the night before or the morning of? So be, be clear on that. It's probably better to say 11.59 p.m. or 12.01 a.m. Better to use singular nouns to avoid ambiguity. So for example, in this sentence, to the knowledge of the sellers, there are no structural problems with the building. So this could mean, let's say there are two sellers, Bob and Teresa. Bob happens to know about structural problems to the building. Teresa doesn't. So since they as a unit don't know, only one of them knows, this is a true statement, arguably. But I think most of us, when we hear this, uh, they would interpret that to mean, well, Bob doesn't know about any structural problems, and also Teresa doesn't know about any structural problems. And so by using the plural, you have uh, created the opportunity for some point of confusion with respect to that. Green shall purchase 200 widgets from ABC Company, provided that ABC manufactures them in blue. Does this mean ABC must first manufacture the the widgets in blue before a before green is required to purchase or these reciprocal conditions mean that both must occur but not stating in order so provided that does that mean that um, green ha can uh, uh, can wait until they've already been manufactured before he uh, purchases 
Will is ambiguous. If you want to say that something must happen, that someone is required to under the terms of the contract, we should say shall or must. May is a permitted situation, not a required situation. The problem with will is will is just a predictor. So we might say Bob will mow Larry's yard by 3 p.m. on Tuesday, June 7th. Well, we don't have any words of command here. This is like a prediction. Hey, you know, we've gotten out our crystal ball and we've seen into the future and ah, we see Bob mowing Larry's lawn at 3 p or before 3 p.m. on Tuesday, June 7th. Oh, but that doesn't mean that Bob is required to do that. We just mean this is how what we predict will happen. Uh, it's just like, you know, on the eve of an election, there's oftentimes a prediction, you know, someone, someone might say, I predict that, you know, Susan Green will become the next president. Well, if it happens that her opponent becomes the president, uh, no contract has been violated. It was just a prediction about the future that didn't end up being correct. So will is not good. The more common phrase is shall. This one does require Bob to take this action. If now if Bob, if he doesn't mow it by 3 p.m. on Tuesday, June 7th, he's in breach of this contractual clause. Use may to mean the party has a right to take this action but isn't required. Green may order 200 more widgets on or before June 7th. He has the option to do so but he is not required to. That and which is a tricky thing. Let's, let's talk about this for a second. Bob has a dog that is a Dalmatian. So in this sen sentence, we're talking about um, uh, the, the fact that he has a dog that is of this particular breed. Um, in this situation, let's assume that our first sentence was Bob has one dog. Bob has a dog that is a Dalmatian. So there would be no need to have this second sentence except for the inclusion of this additional fact. And so this is a necessary part of this fact because if we make this fact go away, we have exactly the same facts that we did before. So in, in contract writing, we assume that everything has a, has a purpose. Let's look at this next sentence though. Bob has two dogs. Oops. Bob has a dog that is a Dalmatian. He's, he's now focusing on this one dog. He, maybe his other dog is a poodle. So this is necessary information. Okay, let's look at this sentence, or these two sentences. Bob has one dog. His one dog, which is a Dalmatian, is also a therapy dog. This is just a nice little addition. We don't need this to distinguish his, his, between his dogs. Now, if we go back and write this sentence and say Bob has two dogs, one of his dogs. Now, we, now we're using this Dalmatian fact to tell us which one of the dogs we're talking about. So now we're going to switch it from a which to a that. One of his dogs that is a Dalmatian is also a therapy dog. That's not a very elegantly written sentence. I apologize for that, but that gets you to the end date or the, 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 the goal there at least in an approximate manner. 
Bi-weekly and bi-monthly are inherently ambiguous in the English language. We never want to use them. Bi-weekly can mean twice in a given week or every other week. Bi-monthly can mean two times in a week or every other month. So you just never want to use those words. Write an, a number with both numbers and letters. So if we want to talk about a purchase price of $437.32, we would say $437.32. Usually the written out numbers will control over the uh, type numbers because it's a lot easier to accidentally type the wrong number than it is to write out the words. Usually cents are not spelled out. You certainly can, but I mean, who really cares whether it's 32 cents or 33 cents? Now, I suppose if we're buying a million units of these, then these start making a difference, right? So under those circumstances, you certainly can write out the numbers. Do not write a contract so that non-parties or inanimate objects have contractual duties. For example, the widget shall be blue. Well, what if they aren't blue? Are you going to sue the widgets? Widgets, you were supposed to be blue. Start being blue right this very second. No. We would say ABC shall manufacture blue widgets, for example, assuming ABC is a part of the contract. Use active voice instead of passive voice to make clear who shall do these tasks. This is the same problem we see here with inanimate objects. The widgets shall be made of aluminum. Who shall make them of aluminum? So, Gore Corporation shall make the widgets of aluminum shall make sorry already talked about the definitions another thing to keep in mind is nobody reads a contract like a good novel don't try to make it interesting don't try to make it stylistically pleasing it's not that type of document you don't want to add subtlety and ambiguity and colorfulness and interest. You want it to be boring. That's this, it's not, I mean, a boring contract is not necessarily a successful contract, but an interesting to read contract, I'm going to have to say, has failed pretty miserably, most likely. Let's flip back to our action steps here. We we talked about replacing nouns with verbs. This is that nominalization. So instead of saying collision, say collide. Instead of saying decision, say decide. Instead of saying payment, say pay. Try to avoid the to be verbs. There's um, eight to be verbs in English. Here, let me uh, take this down so I can. Is, are, Usually don't say see an am in a contract, but am, is, are, was, were, be, being, and been. Better to, again, there will be times, obviously, you will use these words for sure. That's a certainty. But it's a better practice when it makes sense to replace them with verbs that are actually action oriented. You want to avoid sexist language. Um, so instead of saying firemen, you say firefighters. Instead of saying chairman, you say chair. Um, you want to um, use parallel construction when referring to men or women, and you want to avoid using he when a woman might be doing that task, or using she when a male might be doing that task. It might offend, but it also could create some ambiguity. When you say he, are you saying, well, you're breaching the contract if you have a woman do that particular task? And again, 
probably a, a very easy fix in these situations is just to avoid the pronoun entirely. You don't have to use pronouns at all in, in contracts. It's probably a better practice to uh, use them sparingly, if at all. Sometimes it may make sense to use the plural instead of the singular. Um, but as we talked before, sometimes the plural can be dangerous too. So, you ha so there's dangers associated with both going plural and singular. A good idea once you have a draft that you're pretty satisfied with is to step away from it for a while. But we don't always have that luxury when we're under a crunch for time. But uh, perhaps you uh, have another project that you can work on for an hour. Or maybe take your 15 minute break or your, your 30 minute lunch break and then come back to it. You may find that you have a little bit fresher eyes and can spot things that you wouldn't have been able to spot right off the bat. Um, many people think about the revision process as having a macro component and a micro component. Different people use different words for us, but the macro part is more about, well, do I have all the right clauses in them? Do I have them in the right places? Uh, so we're talking about kind of mi mi moving around the big pieces. You know, if you're designing a house, for example, you're thinking about, do I want the master bedroom downstairs or upstairs? Do I want there to be a Jack and Jill between the two upstairs bedrooms? Uh, where do I want the staircase to be? So those would be macro decisions. A micro decision might be, where do I want to have the outlets in the bedroom? Uh, do I want to have a, a light fixture hanging from the ceiling or do I want to rely upon floor and table lamps for lighting in that particular room? Um, how big do I want to have the windows? So if we translate those types of ideas to the revision process, the macro process will be deciding, do I want a statute of limitations clause in it? Yes or no? If I do, where am I going to put it? Then I'm probably going to, when I'm in the micro stage, work on that particular clause. But I'm no longer going to be thinking about, well, do I have it in the right place? That's the decision I've made. Now, you know, sometimes you may discover after you've gone through the document, you've done your macro, you've done your micro, and you're near the finish line, you may look in and go, gosh, I thought that made sense there. But now that I've really gotten it pretty well tweaked, it just doesn't. It doesn't fit. Um, or somebody comes to you who's, who's also working on the dot contract and you think it's close to being done, but he or she says, I just don't think this, this fits here. I think we should move it to this other section. So sometimes you will go back and after you've done micro for a while, go back and do macro. And that's okay. That's part of life. Um, if you go back and do micro, macro, realize that you're probably going to have to redo some of the micro that you've done, at least on, on that that neighborhood in your particular document. So the ma macro reviews the writing as a whole. Does the writing do what it was intended to do? Is the organization strong? Should the paragraphs or sections be reorganized? Are there any paragraphs redundant or unnecessary? Are there any sentences redundant or unnecessary? Should any sentences be eliminated? Are there sections missing that we need to add? The, the micro is about the more internal elements. Things like, am I using ambiguous words? Are my sentences too long? Um, those particular problems we've already talked about in the, the uh, uh, other examples, are they um, ambiguous? Of course, grammar and spelling, that goes without question. Punctuation. Uh, there's, there's cases out there for sure where parties have paid millions of dollars because either a missing comma wasn't inserted or a comma that shouldn't have been inserted was inserted. So punctuation is a big deal. Well-written drafts, well-written documents require many drafts. No one writes a contract and revises it once or twice and has a document that's stamp ready, that's ready to go out. It's just not possible. It requires a lot of work. What I find is that students usually have a document that's pretty good for a second or third draft. They just haven't taken the drafts to that, uh, that stamp ready that, okay, we've gone through, we've looked at everything standpoint. 
sometimes they may have run out of time and that happens to us all can't can't really happen once you're out practicing but when you're doing homework you know it does happen sometimes um, but sometimes I think it's the students may not know exactly what to do and so the documents that I posted these checklists may give you some ideas for for things to do you can use this as a checklist you can look through and do your word count for each one of your sentences uh, test let me just show you how you would do this uh, so you have a sense. I'm gonna we're just gonna check this one sentence here I am going to do a review and I'm going to check the word count okay I have um, 15 words here there's actually two sentences that's pretty good ideally you want to have sentences that are 20 words or less I'm going to do a spelling and grammar check Wait a second, I don't know why I didn't just do what I wanted it to do. Huh. Options, proofing, Oh, I don't have the readability statistics turned on. Sorry about that. My bad. So I've, I've, let me just show you where to find this. Let me go back. Okay, so if you want to check this, you go over here to File. You go to Options. You go to Proofing. I like to check for these top four and for all of these items. I'm going to check for grammar and refinements. I'm going to check for settings. Um, I'm going to check for passive voice, passive noise with an unknown actor. I'm going to check for most of these things. We do check for the Oxford comma. We want to have punctuation with, I want it inside, and I only want to have a single space between sentences. We'll go ahead and check for cliches too. And yeah, we'll check for, I mean, the thing of it is, even though they're checking for things that maybe we won't agree about, at least we'll have a starting point. Okay, so we have 14 words, one paragraph, two sentences. So we have two sentences per paragraph. We have seven words per sentence. You can see that the grade level is a ninth grade reading level. We don't have any passive voice sentences. Uh, so you can see that's a pretty effective example. So, th so the statistics that Word can give you will get you a pretty far down the road to evaluate. Let's consider let's just consider this sentence right here. So this one has 14 words a sentence. Um, it's not in passive voice. Um, it gives us a, so it, it, it's, it doesn't apparently check for uh, the closeness of the subject with the verb. So word isn't gonna check for everything that you want to check for. It's good to know what word will check for and what it won't. It will find passive voice. So let me just do one a sentence in passive voice. The letter was mailed to Aaron by Bob. So we'll just look at these three sentences here. Ignore what, so it's reminding me about the passive voice. I'm just gonna ignore and we'll get a, a grade here. Looked at three sentences, uh, words per sentence is a little bit over this. It has one of its sentences in passive voice. It finds the sentence is very simple, um, but the fact that one sentence was in passive voice did, I'm sure, drop this a number a little bit lower. Anyway, this can be a helpful guide. Use Word to help you get some of this data points, some of these data points. 
go through and just look for normalizations. Go through and look for negations. All of these steps if you're looking for additional edits to do. If you're not sure what to do after your second or third edit, hopefully these are some ideas that you may want to explore. Obviously check spelling, punctuation, and grammar. You don't need to do this throughout the process. And as students, you know, will still be in the macro phrase of it. They're still moving the big furniture around the room. And um, it doesn't make sense to worry about grammar at that point because that sentence that you're so focused on getting all the grammar good is probably going to be rewritten 12 different times before you get to the finish. So why perfect something that you're then going to tear up you know a little bit later um, it's a little bit like um, you know putting the fruit in the fruit bowl on the coffee table when you know you're going to end up moving the coffee table 12 more times before you're done why not wait for those finishing details until you actually need them at the very end so this this is stuff you're going to focus on near the end you know why spell why worry about spelling that word when you might well change that word to some other format Use the Oxford comma. That's a serial comma. Let me show you. Oops, wait a second. Let me go back here and we'll talk a little bit about the Oxford comma. So here we have, I will buy an apple, a gallon of milk, and orange juice. Okay, so the question is, do I put a comma here or not? If I put a comma here, I'm gonna have three things in my basket. An apple, a gallon of milk, and some orange juice. If I don't put a comma here, it looks like I'm only gonna have two things in my basket at the grocery store. An apple and some very strange beverage that has both milk and, or, and orange juice in the gallon container. It's also weirdly phrased because usually when you have two items in your list, you're just going to unite them with a comma and not have a comma there. So it's, you're not quite sure what to do with it. Something's gone wrong. Either you missed this comma here or you have a very strange beverage and you shouldn't have this comma here. Is the Oxford comma required in English? It isn't. And when I say Oxford comma, I mean this comma right here. It's not required. And in fact, when you read most books and most newspapers, you won't see the Oxford comma. I think the reason is that um, the Oxford comma, you know, if you use it consistently, takes up more print space. You know, the ink that is used isn't free. And it certainly takes more paper to write that particular item. And so as a result, uh, newspapers and books have typically uh, decided to save the ink and sacrificed a little bit of precision with the language. Again, legal writers are more interested in the precision than in saving trees or ink and things along those lines. So we are big proponents of the Oxford comma. There will occasionally be times though when Oxford comma will actually make a sentence more ambiguous. And so be aware that there can be some times where it's smart to drop the Oxford comma, but err on the side of inclusion of that comma and not exclusion of that comma. Um, pretty commonly, I see students get commas, colons, and semicolons confused. Um, be sure that you know when to use which one. Um, the simpler, the shorter your sentences are, the safer you're going to be if you're not confident in these areas. Um, but even in those cases, you ultimately are going to have to learn what these functions are. That's especially true with commas and semicolons. You, if you don't know when to use one or the other, don't guess. Just go ahead and look it up to make sure that you are uh, using the right format for that particular grammatical rule. Well, let me show you where to find all these tools that we've been going through. Um, here, let me launch the student view for this. So I'm going to go down to chapter 17. And what I've done is I have taken, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong class. Forget that. We'll go to the right class here. I apologize.
Gonna scroll down to chapter 17. And you can see I have um, some items here, contract gra drafting guidelines, drafting a contract. This is the PowerPoint and organization of a contract. These are the three items that I've used in this lecture. Well, I hope that this presentation has been helpful. As always, if you have questions about the content, please don't hesitate to contact me. My email is cgroover at colin.edu, uh, or better yet, come and see me so we can talk about these ideas face to face. I would love to uh, engage in a discussion about these in more detail. As always, I thank you for your attention, and I hope that you have a wonderful day. Take care.